Welcome to Los Angeles, a city synonymous with a silver screen, health, and affluence. No other place in the world is as right with dreamers and romantics all hunting down their destiny. To the outside, that is LA. But I would argue the contrary, that no experience exemplifies the soul of our city more than standing at a food truck on a dimly lit street corner, taco juice dripping down your arms, greasily fingering the last bit of onions, cilantro, and fallen meat into your mouth. That food is more often than not the cuisine of an immigrant population whose entrepreneurial spirit exists in every delicious morsel you eat. That is the soul of LA. There is nothing more representative of the American dream than food trucks. It is an opportunity for home cooks and dreamers to hit the streets and put their skills to the test. But it's far from the independent venture it's thought to be. In a land famous for its glitz and glamour, there is distinctive grit. A looming darkness exists, spreading through our industry, wisping and curling, wrapping itself around our ankles and limbs, sucking us into the concrete. Movies and media have glorified food trucks. The assumption is of ultimate independence. But that wind in your hair, sun on your back, good old-fashioned American entrepreneurialism couldn't be farther from the truth. The food truck bubble burst. My name is Ram Man, and I own Swami's Sandwiches. I started my food truck four years ago with the hopes and dreams of becoming a chef, believing that the only thing standing in my way was myself. I couldn't have been more wrong. What I naively thought would be an independent venture, free to carve out my own path, turned out to be a very structured, organized, and rigid business where I have very little control. Due to overpopulation, the food truck industry has forcefully evolved into a hyper-organized ladder where the trucks reside at the very bottom. They are taken advantage of, bullied, ripped off, and forced into submission until they are forced to close their doors. And with that, their dreams. Uh, here we are in La Raza Foods. This is where the day starts and ends, Sun Valley, California. So it's going to be a long day ahead. Let's go. The reality for most is that the finish line we look towards is actually a mirage. A brutal obstacle course whose system almost guarantees failure. Many of us don't know that until we're in too deep, desperately trying to salvage the remnants of our humanity. Seven o'clock, seven fifteen, seven forty-five. So leaving the commissary, got propane, got gas, the shopping there. We're gonna stop at Restaurant Depot, get the bulk of all the other stuff we need, and head out to Santa Monica for a shift. So this is probably my least favorite part of the day. Uh, once in a while, I do have to deal with the 405 freeway, and today's that day. So a lot of traffic, bacon in the sun. You guys get to be with me all day. That we serve during normal lunch hours, so about 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock. In order to do that service, usually at the commissary by 6, 6.30. By the time you do all the shopping, prepping, gas, propane, obviously the driving commutes the, the longest part of it. And then if it's just one shift, usually back there by about 4 o'clock. Uh, finish up, break down the truck, prep, get set up, whatever you can for the, for the next day. Um, but often, more often than not, we do double shifts, we do lunch and dinner. Uh, so usually those days are you're at the commissary by 6, then we're dropping the truck back off by 11 or 12. Uh, so you're putting 18 hour days, and then when you start doing those back to back, you're going home, not even really to sleep. You know, you got six, seven hours in between dropping off the truck to have to be back there again to pick it up. So it's, it's, it's 
exhausting. It's never ending. It never stops. And um, you know, for six hours of service, three hours for lunch, and three hours for dinner, you're putting in 18 hours of work. Yeah, I work around the 16 hours a day. I work about 17 hours a day. I work about 22 hours. I have done at times. It's only 12 hours a day. Dinner, you're close to 18 hours. And how many days a week are you doing? We do shifts? we do double shifts typically four to five days a week. More often than not, my days start at my commissary at 6 a.m. and don't end until around midnight. That's 18 hours of driving, cooking, prepping, and shopping. At red lights and traffic jams, I'm bidding on spots to serve with various booking companies, invoicing, insurance paperwork, and submitting menus for various events. In its simplest, it's absolute chaos. So the rest, we make all of our stuff from scratch. For example, I couldn't make our pickles to last us six months. But I have to do the pickles weekly, I have to do the sauces every day, um, have to get the bread delivered fresh every single day. But um, the constant shopping is depending on where you are. If lunch was much busier than you expected, you have to stop and load up before dinner. So we have restaurant depots, kind of where we get the bulk of the stuff we need. Uh, then we have the smart finals, kind of all over in between for whatever little things you kind of need to buy and like sub bulk. Uh, but that's just part of the chaos. The whole industry is organized. If you think it's about pulling up to a random curb and selling until you run out, you won't last long. Any free spot that proves fruitful will be swarmed upon by other trucks and bled dry. To solve the problem of public parking, bookers sprung up and started lots. A booker is a middleman, and a lot is any place a food truck goes to serve, be it corporate office or weekly meetup. Bookers make arrangements with property management for trucks to park free of competition. For their efforts, the bookers charge a fee. Do you feel most food truck bookers are honest? I don't feel that most food truck bookers are honest, but along the lines, they lost focus that they actually need us. They need us for their business, you know, and we don't need them. We will be okay without them. These spots will continue even after they're gone. They need us and they've lost sight of all of the work that we do. So are, is it fair to say that dishonest bookers stay in business because they're preying on, uh, new undereducated food trucks and I think they definitely take advantage of the fact that they don't know yet they don't have the connections with but with trucks that have been here for a longer period of time they don't have those connections to ask all the questions yet they don't have all the intel that these veteran food trucks have so you know they're taking these bookers word for it and it's ultimately what's costing them their business a 10 percent fee was always standard until bookers started squeezing the trucks for more money they stopped instituting a percentage in lieu of a flat fee. But most don't monitor sales, so therefore have no idea how much a spot is actually worth. We have to pay these large fees in advance with no chance of a refund, incurring 100% of the risk 100% of the time. If it rains and no one shows, we take the loss every time. In the end, we usually end up paying between 15 and 40 percent of our sales. All right, and so how how is it all structured? So do you just you set up? You just go park wherever you want? No, that's the big myth about food trucks. I mean, I think a lot of people think that you know you just park anywhere on the street, you open your doors, and and people just start coming. But the the misconception is that a gourmet truck like ours can just pull up anywhere on the street set up pay the meter and open the doors and it's like chef and there's a there's a line of people just waiting for you to open up that never happens so the booker does add value because we get exclusivity the bad thing of course is that when the booker gets um the, the, when the fee is not commensurate with the amount of business that's done right. so you're talking about so all bookers charge a fee all bookers charge a fee you know which is 10 percent you know of sales that's a pretty reasonable fee and that's pretty much been the industry standard you know for a long time up until recently while it started off probably very you know, with good intentions and adding value, a lot of other bookers started stepping in 
and really started polluting the waters. You know, we have a minimum that we need to kind of hit, otherwise it's just not economical. And the rule of thumb for me is like $500. If I can't make $500, it's not even worth it because $500 I just break even. I don't make any money. I'm just paying, you know, paying for the gas, paying for the commissary, paying for my lease, paying for my employees, paying for the food, but paying for the booker, but I'm not paying myself. You know. So you're talking, so $500, we're talking gross sales. Yeah, gross sales. So $500 gross sales for a chef is a break-even point. Yeah, so, it's a rule of thumb for me. Yeah, so definitely. safe to say anything beneath that, you're operating at a loss. Yeah, for pretty much. Day. So how, how often would you say in the you know first couple of years you were losing money? You know, money on at least 50%, 60% of the spots. That many stops were, were, were money losers. And, you know, unfortunately those stops still exist because there's a lot of trucks that they start off and they don't know anything about those stops as well. Yeah. What keeps these bookers in business? Quite simply, what keeps these bookers in business is uninformed brand new trucks. So it's fair to say that the new trucks who don't know the business, don't know the economics, enter into business with a lot of these bad bookers and those are primarily the people that keep these bad bookers in business. Absolutely, that, that, you know, that's exactly what happens. Is it common practice in the food truck industry, especially in Los Angeles, that a lot of these food truck bookers are actually providing like bad information? Oh, absolutely. So you have you have the food truck owners and you have the bookers. Is there any type of regulating bodies that oversee this whole process? Is there any protection that food trucks have? We don't have like protection. We have an association, which I would say that largely the association, you know, whether it's it's by, you know, just limitations that they have legally or whether it's just they don't want to pursue it in, in a more aggressive manner, they just have been fairly ineffective in that. I mean, it's you know, we, we can try and affect change, but really at the end of the day, it comes down to the, the trucks speaking up for themselves and saying that we're not going to do this. All right, so we're out here in Santa Monica. That's where we're going to have our lunch service today. So far, we's, we've uh, showed up at the commissary. We've prepped, we've shopped, we've driven, uh, we've prepped at the location. Uh, we're in about hour five of the day, and we're just about to open for lunch as soon as my sweet wife gets here. And uh, one of the restrictions about parking in Santa Monica is you'll see there's some food trucks around. You have to have four spots in between every truck. So it's just a way for them to regulate and not have the trucks kind of coming into the location and just totally dominate and leave parking for everybody else. So if you look around, you'll see there's at least four spots in between each truck. And it's just almost just about 11.30. We open. We'll be here from 11.30 to 2. We're going to break down, drive out to Santa Clarita for dinner. So food truck all about limited space, so we don't have a bunch of propane burners and stove, so everything goes on the flat top. So if you boil water, boil vinegar, whatever it is, flat top is our only main, is our only dry heat source. So if we can't grill it or fry it, we just can't do it on the menu. So when you go to the truck and you have a hundred questions of do you have this, do you have that? This is why we're super limited on not only on space, we're super limited on equipment. And that's uh, so why for us we have a really small menu because we just we do what we do and we just can't physically do what we can do. From outside perspectives, food trucks are cash cows, low overhead money factories. Go where you want, do what you please for as long as you like, right? The truth is that a far darker, more sinister experience exists. Perhaps too scared to fight back or not possessing the tools to do so, the cycle of greed and coercion has spurred an epidemic in our industry, ripping our livelihood right out from underneath us. Three out of four of us don't make it out of the first year. If you have any delusion that running a food truck is easy, fun, or independent, listen carefully, because the reality is a far cry from the dream. All right, we're just wrapping up lunch, two o'clock. Uh, it's the end of hour eight. So now we're gonna break down, head all the way out to Santa Clarita. We got a brewery over there for dinner. So, see you guys soon. The main issue with the trucks to make it so difficult to make a living and uh, the money's so, such a small amount is that everywhere we go, we pay fees. So we're not just pulling up on random streets or random spots and opening the doors and selling. Everything is totally organized and we pay fees to organizers who set up spots for us. The thing with that, it's all supposed to be based on 10% fees. But over time, organizers have constantly raised the fees or tell us that sales are higher than they are. And so you go in that 10% can end up being 20, 30, 40%. And when your margins are only you know, 20 to 30%, there are definitely days that we lose money. And I think the, uh, the, the emotion that that like, draws out is just is bitterness because I mean, the only way to compare that is if you, you go to work all day, you work an eight hour day, uh, each shift from your boss at the end of the day as opposed to collecting your paycheck, you know, you give them a $50 bill for the pleasure of allowing you to come in and do work and make them money. And that's the frustrating thing. That's the hardest thing with the trucks. And 
the organizers don't care, and if you complain about it or raise issue about it, they just blackball you from events, blackball you from spots that you visit. The shitty thing about that is that the trucks are the ones who are there every day building up a spot. I mean, the organizers put in like the base effort initially to get everything going, but the trucks go every day. We bring in the clientele, you know, we bring regulars, and then the thing is you complain about it, they kick you out, all of a sudden you've lost the spot that you've invested, you know, sometimes in years in setting up. You know, you lose a huge customer base from a spot you might go to weekly, and that's like the general attitude with the organizers. And they, you know, they call them like, kind of like a telephone tough guy scenario because we never see them, we can never get them on the phone, everything's only done through email and their websites and booking systems. Um, so it's very easy for them to kind of take that hard line, that big like fuck you attitude, because they don't care, you never have to meet them face to face, you can never deal with them. And that's how the whole thing is structured, and that's the stuff that, you know, I and my wife Chrissy are really trying to change, because it's getting worse and worse and worse, and even in the four years that we've been doing it, it just never ends. It continues to get worse and those fees get higher and higher and our margins get smaller and smaller. And that's just the most bitter part of doing this. Like the work is hard, it's brutal, uh, it's not rewarding. At the end of the day, when you're working 18 hours a day and you're losing money, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain to someone who hasn't really been through it, but it's just fucking brutal. It's tough when you put in 12 to 18 hour days and you, know, you have nothing to show for it at the end of the day and you know that Booker's walking away with 10% of your sales. I mean, and, and not 10% of your bottom line, not, you know, and that's that's in a good situation. I mean, or they're, or they're walking with 20 or 30% of your sales or a flat fee and they don't care how much you did. Yeah. It feels like shit. It doesn't feel good to be taken advantage by someone who doesn't understand the business like we do and doesn't understand the, the work that goes into it. You feel miserable and you feel not appreciated because uh, you lost your time and uh, money and uh, you are kind of uh, depressed. Feels like somebody's dipping into your dream and taking part of it. We're working so hard, everyone wants to come and take a piece of it. I mean, Uncle Sam's taking, he's taking his piece. Our, our wholesalers, they're taking their piece. Where we lease our truck from, they're taking their piece. Where we park from, they're taking their piece. Our employees are taking their piece. At the end of the day, we literally have the little bitty piece. And then a booker comes along and says, in order for you to even make that little bit of piece, you gotta give me this amount of money. I don't care if you make money or not, this is what it costs. Maybe that's not so fair. The look on the faces of all these people I work with. You know, we, we're there at the same time before the sun rises. You know, we drop these trucks back off at midnight, just in time for them to get clean, for us to go home and get some sleep and come back. And just seeing the wear and tear on people's face, you know, knowing that they're not making money or we're not making money, we're all suffering. It's fucking terrible. I think the, th the thing the organizers don't really understand is that we have message boards and all the trucks communicate. So if I go to an organizer and say, hey, this spot you're quoting as you know a thousand dollar spot, people are doing four or five hundred bucks here. But when you quote a thousand bucks, I'm showing you with extra food, extra staff members, and when it's really not making that much money, it's totally crushing us. And there's no point in us wasting our time there for the day. And you know the things that they'll say is, well, other trucks are making that much. Other trucks are doing a thousand. In the meantime, we're communicating on these message boards, and I'll put out, hey, I did this spot today. I did 400 bucks, it's supposed to be a thousand. Like what's everyone else doing? When everyone's coming back, no, I'm doing 300, 400 dollars there. But you're paying the organizers 100 bucks, like they don't get it. They're so far removed from us, from us, they don't understand how fucking crippling it is and how shitty it makes us feel to go put all that effort. It just feels like we're being duped on a regular basis, just duped and treated like suckers. And it's it sucks, it really sucks. There's no other way around, there's no other way to describe it. If we question these ever-increasing fees, bookers blackball us from events and locations we have invested years in building, imparting a devastating blow to our business, ripping the rug right out from underneath us. Organizers and promoters operate in anonymity. We rarely ever see them or talk to them. Everything is done through emails. With so many trucks and a culture of desperation, there is always a truck willing to do the work for less money. Despite the assumption our costs are extremely high in comparison to restaurants, 
We have a fraction of the hours in a day to sell our product, no ability to sell alcohol, and a plethora of multiple cities' permits and fees that are raised. So what happens if, if the food trucks go to the bookers and say, hey, we've talked to all the food trucks, the sales you're, provide, you're providing are triple or quadruple what the sales actually are. What happens then? So if we were to go to a booker and say that what that they're falsifying information that they're providing for the food trucks, what typically happens is we just get blacklisted. Is it common practice for bookers to blacklist trucks from spots? Absolutely. Being blacklisted is it happens all the time. We've personally been blacklisted for for speaking up, for speaking up for our food truck, for all the food trucks in our industry. So what happens at these city sponsored events when you go to the city and report what's going on between these booking companies and the trucks? Um, an example of a city sponsored event is last year there was a big, big, big Los Angeles event. They had an outside party, a third party come and they're a very well known company come and provide all the food trucks. They're an events company. Well, the fee was around 40%, and we had a problem with that, obviously. We've been to this event, so we knew what sales were. So this 40% was completely irrational and unfair and greedy, to be honest. We raised issue. We were blacklisted from the event. We had to reach out to the city, and the city invited us back after we took it as far as going to the city. But did the city know that they had raised the fee to 40%? So when we talked to the city about this event, they had no idea, which is what happens a lot of times. When you bring in a third party, a lot of the events that are that are being put on, they don't know that these third parties are either charging or they don't know what the fees that they're charging are. What do you need to do as food trucks to protect yourself? If we want this industry to change and if we want it to get better, we need to come together as a food truck industry and realize that we are worth more than, than what these organizers are saying we're worth. All right, so we're on hour about 16. We're leaving Santa Clarita and head back to drop off the truck at the commissary. Um, totally fucking wiped out. Um, drove for about four hours today, cooked for about seven hours, had a couple unexpected repairs, sent it back for an hour. The truck cleaner quit towards the end of the shift, had to find someone else. And all in all, it's a pretty average day. So this is what it takes, this is what the reality is. Uh, these doubles we do probably three times a week, if not more. Uh, so by the time it's all said and done, probably 17 hour a day. Uh, go back, go home, sleep for a few hours, and do it all over again. So if you want to open a food shop, think about that. Because that's what it is. There's no way to get around it, as much as I wish there were. So now we have our freeway. It is closed. So we're going to have to find the detour. There is hope. Despite the hardships we face, food trucks have started to band together. In cities all around the country, they are realizing their worth and beginning a very long fight. A national dialogue has spurred from the rubble. Enough is enough. For within that same spirit that pushes us through every day lies an insurmountable amount of strength that will carry us out the other end. For our future is as bright as our days are long.